It's not fair. How come a bear can go eat 100,000 extra calories, lay down and sleep for a few months, and not end up with crazy high blood glucose and not become diabetic? But if I go and I overeat for an extended period of time and then just I'm sedentary, I'm gonna totally mess my body up. Believe it or not, there is a translation between how bears can self-regulate their insulin and their ability to use fuels and how humans can manipulate their diet to get similar effects. And we're learning a lot from both. It's really interesting. Now, I'm not a bearologist, okay, but I can do enough research and look at National Geographic to understand that bears hibernate and don't become diabetic, right? So what is the difference here? What's happening with humans, especially when you look at low carb and fasting, right? There is a direct correlation. So bears have three phases. They have a phase where they're active, a phase where they're eating a ton in the fall and gaining a bunch of weight. And from what I've seen, they eat like 20, 30, 40,000 calories and gain eight to 15 pounds per day, okay? And then they have their hibernation period where they're sleeping for months. Obviously, if that was the case in humans, that would lead to diabetes, right? Like, huge bolus of food and then being sedentary. But what's interesting is researchers actually thought of this and they looked at bears and they found there was something very interesting. They found that their cells are totally different when they hibernate compared to when they're active. So what they did is they took their adipocytes, they took fat cells from hibernating bears and then they took fat cells from non-hibernating bears, from active bears, okay? And they exposed those cells to honey so they were exposing them to fructose and glucose. And what they found is that the inactive hibernating bears were insulin resistant. Their cells actually just pushed away. They just didn't take the glucose. They wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't accept carbs. The active bears, their cells did. Now this really paints a really nice picture of things that I've talked about for a long time, right? When you're inactive, that's a good time to maybe be doing a little bit lower carb or maybe do intermittent fasting, things like that. And if you're more active, then you're a candidate for potentially having more carbs. But what's different with bears is that this is autonomically happening. This is, their, their bodies are self-regulating, okay? Now, what's really cool about this is when a bear is hibernating, by turning off the ability to use glucose at a cellular level, it forces that cell to use fat. That is what's cool. That's why a bear can put on 100 pounds of fat and it will burn directly that fat even while they're sleeping. Because you know what they've done? They've made themselves hyper fat adapted and peripherally insulin resistant. That is something, if you're a veteran of this channel, something I talk about a lot. Peripheral insulin resistance is not the same as pathological insulin resistance. Okay, peripheral insulin resistance means when you are doing low carb or when you are fasting, your glucose goes a little bit higher because the cells stop using the glucose because they're sparing glucose for the brain, meaning your cells use the fat, just like a hibernating bear. The hibernating bear is sleeping, so the glucose is spared for the brain, for all the restorative, different consolidation things that are happening at the brain level, and the cells within the actual body are forced to use fat. Hmm. This sounds a lot like what we talk about when we're talking about lower carb or ketogenic and fat adaptation with fasting, right? Not saying it's the perfect way, but it makes a lot of sense now. We'd like to be able to use our stored fat, right? Seems like a pretty cool thing. Now, at a bare level, if we get nuancy with what's happening here, researchers found that there are eight different proteins that were kind of affecting and manipulating this, okay? So in essence, bears were able to like, turn off GLUT4 coming to the membrane of a cell at a gene expression level. Like it was still starting to happen, but it wasn't really completing, right? So what that essentially means is their cells weren't able to take glucose, just like I've mentioned. They also found that GLUT1, which is another glucose transporter, normally helps bring glucose into a cell. They found that GLUT1 was suppressed in a hibernating bear, but not suppressed in an active bear. It just goes to tell us once again that there are logical times where carbohydrates are okay when we're active, and then there are times when maybe we're more sedentary and carbohydrates aren't the best thing. But we can learn a lot from what's happening with a bear, believe it or not, and somewhat translate it to us. So if we are not super, super active, maybe that's a good time to do a little bit more lower carbs. So we have less carbs coming in. We make ourselves a little bit more peripherally insulin resistant so that the body is forced to utilize those fats and spare glucose for the brain. 
Now, there's one very, very key difference between humans and bears, and it's not just fur. It's the fact that we need to move year round, whereas a bear is designed to have periods of time where they just completely go sedentary. I will say probably the most important thing for a human that is different from a bear is we need consistent protein year round because we are active. Okay, now we are active, which means we always have this balance of muscle protein breakdown and muscle protein synthesis. We need to be active because that doesn't just help us metabolically, but it helps us maintain muscle mass, which maybe this is a case for bear longevity, but I don't know. Maybe bears need to measure their muscle mass and their VO2 max. But with humans, we do know that muscle mass is a very important indicator of metabolic health as we get older. So if we just said, we're going to cut out carbs, eat a bunch of fats, try to get as many calories as we can, that would backfire. We need to keep protein high. I put a link down below for ButcherBox. That's where I get most of my grass-fed, grass-finished beef. So that link down below will get you some of the cuts that I personally like. So I'm a big fan of ribeyes. I'm also a really big fan of fillets. I like my fatty steaks on certain occasions, and then I like my lean steak most of the time. So good New York strip, really good fillets, but they also have shrimp. They also have uh, things like wild caught cod. They have sockeye salmon, like a plethora of different things. But I gotta say, it's their grass-fed, grass-finished beef that just does it for me. It's like, to me, that's the best tasting beef I've probably ever had. So I put a link down below, and then it gets delivered directly to your doorstep. Super easy. They've been a sponsor on this channel for like six years now. They're one of the original ones. So anyway, that link is in the first line of the description. You gotta check them out. And please, if you try one thing, just get a bunch of their ribeyes. They're amazing. Whether you decide to go low carb, fast, or not, it's still very advantageous for us to keep moving. If you were to take a bear situation when they're hibernating and actually make them move in the same metabolic situation, they would incinerate fat like crazy. The problem is, is when a bear starts to move, their entire dynamic shifts and their cells become insulin sensitive again. So they can't really tap into that. We can manipulate our diet in such a way where we can become a quote unquote hibernating bear while we're still active. So think about it, hibernating bear, allocating most fat for, for usage. Moving human, allocating fat for usage. Who's gonna burn more calories? Something moving or something at rest, right? We can intervene with our diet, but we do need to keep moving. There was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine recently that said that by 2030, one out of two people are going to be obese in the US. And one out of every four people are going to be severely obese. This is very, very sketchy. So one of the best ways that we can combat this is simply walking, no matter what. Walking is easy. There's a study published in the journal Lancet that took a look at 15 individual cohort studies. They divided them into four groups. The first group, 3,500 steps per day on average. The second group, 5,800 steps per day on average. The third group, 7,800 steps per day on average. And the fourth group, just shy of 11,000 steps per day on average. They found that there was a dose-dependent relationship between mortality and the number of steps taken. The 5,800 step group had a 40% less chance of dying, all-cause mortality, compared to the low step group. The 7,800 step group had a 45% less chance of dying. And the 11,000 step group had a 53% less chance of dying compared to the low step group. The bottom line is that this is very, very critical metabolically and it all ties into what, what's going on here. If you're eating carbs, walking is gonna make you utilize those carbs better and increase insulin independent and dependent glucose uptake. If you're not eating carbs, it's gonna encourage you to burn fat and improve insulin sensitivity. You can't find a way in which you don't win with walking. Okay. And if you're discouraged at all by this, like I can't walk that much, there was another study that demonstrated by just increasing your step count 1,000 steps from where you are now per day, not 1,000 each day, but 1,000 per day from where you are now, will lead to a 12% reduction in all-cause mortality risk. 12% less chance of dying just by increasing your step count 1,000 steps from where you are today. Okay, so the bottom line, if you're less active, reduce the carbohydrates. If you're less active, you might be a good candidate to do maybe some more low carb, maybe have some fasting. If you are active, then that's okay to implement some carbohydrates into the mix now and then. You can still intermittent fast, but be flexible. It's okay to have periods of time where you utilize carbs and periods of time where you don't. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.